The XY Advisor podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. XY Advisor does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Financial advisors help Australians live better lives, and we're great at it. But what about us? For us to thrive in the coming years, I'm here to ask a very big question. How can we live better, run better businesses, and help more clients along the way? My name is Jessica Brady, and I would love for you to join me as I listen and learn from experts who answer these very big questions. I am lucky enough to record most of my podcasts on Gadigal Land. This episode is brought to you by Australian Retirement Trust, a fund that's more super for you and your clients. With more than 2 million members and over $200 billion under management, they have more access to super smart investments at home and abroad. They're committed to working with over 4,000 advisors and delivering a world of investment opportunities to help your clients live the retirement they want. Visit australianretirementtrust.com.au forward slash advisor. Include Super Savings and QSuper FUM and members at June 2022. Hello, wonderful XY community. Before we get into today's podcast, I want to tell you a little story as to why I got today's expert on. Many months ago, I was actually introduced to a friend of a friend at a party, a real life party. And as soon as she found out that I was an advisor, she grabbed me and looked very concerned and said, I think I've done something wrong. And I said, okay, what have you done? She said, I've used my dad's financial advisor and I think he may not be legit. And I said, why do you think he might not be legit? And she said to me, because I can't see him online. His website doesn't have much on about him. He doesn't have a very big LinkedIn profile. I can't find anything about him and I'm not sure that I've done the right thing. And it got me thinking about the next generation of clients who get advice and what they need to have from us to trust us. We talk a lot about becoming a profession and what it means for the journey to become professionals. And the next generation are demanding that we don't just become professionals, that in fact, we become experts, experts that have an online presence, experts that aren't afraid to share their voice and their opinion about topics that matter to them, experts that build trust and credibility through all of the online mediums. Thus, this week, I decided it would make sense to interview someone who specializes in just this. Enter Olivia Cromwell. Now, Olivia has been a media comms and marketing professional for over 15 years. She has worked both in Australia and internationally. And one of the things that she did that really piqued my interest was worked with a really successful law law firm overseas to get their partners to be known amongst the community and for their specialization. It was quite a journey and I'm sure you can imagine some did it better than others, but I wanted to pick her brains about what does it take to be good at PR, like genuinely good at PR? How do you stand out amongst the crowd and how much time, strategy and tactical uh, practice do you actually need to put in before you can expect return on investment? So please enjoy this week's recording. Hi, Olivia. Hi, Jess. Thank you so much for being here today. My pleasure. We're going to cover all things media, communications, and I guess a little bit about marketing and how marketing wraps into all of that because this is your expertise. Yes, this is my area of expertise. Okay, let's jump straight in because I have so very many questions for you. I fear that we're going to run out of time knowing how much you and I like to talk about these things. I want to start with a really broad and general question around PR. For us simple folk, Liv, can you tell us very generally what falls under the umbrella to be considered a PR? Well, PR or public relations as it was initially known Mm. is a very broad term and, and over the years has evolved quite a bit. So initially it was the old school PR people were would approach media professionals mm. on behalf of organisations or individuals and they would manage the media. Mm-hmm. But that was back when media was a far more mysterious beast than what it is now. Mm-hmm. And so there were, you know, professionals engaged 
particularly to do that. So PR agencies, PR professionals or internally PR comms people were hired to manage those relationships with media. But as media has evolved, so has the PR landscape. So Mm. it's now a a much more varied uh, profession and and obviously people who do it um, can come from many different avenues. So why do you think it's important for us being within professional services to care about PR? Well, anyone who cares about their reputation should care about PR, basically. Mm -hmm. And in professional services, your reputation is is your livelihood. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's so important. And also because in professional services, um, unlike goods marketing or or product marketing, you're you're marketing your expertise, you're marketing your knowledge, Mm. your, your intelligence, essentially. And the best way to do that is to talk about issues and and to talk about your industry in an informed way. And then that's where the PR side of things comes in, because then you're talking to media who are obviously covering those topics. So it's sort of a uh, symbiotic relationship in that respect. We've talked about this in the past, and I hope we can talk about it today. You actually explained to me, which makes so much sense, there's almost two sides to this in that there's sort of the reactive side if a Mm. company or a senior executive needs to, I guess, get on the front foot and work with media to... I don't know, do a press release or do something Mm. um, about something that's happened in the company. But then there's also the thought leadership piece. Mm. I'd imagine they're quite different in terms of how you approach them. They are, yeah. Some people are trying to avoid the media and others are trying to to get in front of the media. It depends, I guess, on what your uh, organisation or you as an individual are dealing with at that time. Obviously, Mm. if something's gone wrong, it's normally the media are chasing you and you're trying to avoid them. Mm. But, yeah, the thought leadership side of it is where, you as either a professional, you as an organisation are trying to get in front of the media because that builds profile, that builds brand, that builds reputation, etc. So it just depends on where where you're at and and what's happened and what's transpired and also what's happening in the broader economy, for instance, and and where your organisation or where you as a professional fit in. So with social media, the beast that is social media, I'm keen to understand what's been the impact to PR given that social media is so prevalent and I want to say so easy, <laughs> but you know that I say that with um, clear sarcasm because I don't think it's that easy. But but how has social media changed PR? It's changed it in a couple of different ways. One is because journalists are now a lot more approachable via their social media channels. Oh, yeah. Secondly, individuals now can build their own profile via social media so they're not as reliant on mainstream media so that's Mm. the other side of it Mm. and then I guess as well the overlap between the two so we saw earlier in well actually it was last year the the Facebook mainstream media standoff and so the two have become much more intertwined so mainstream media relies on social media and social media to a certain degree relies on mainstream media so those those combined factors plus individuals own accounts within social media platforms, giving both journalists their own audience as standalone, as, as journalists, their own audience, i.e. via Twitter is a very popular one for journalists. Mm-hmm. Um, and then also for professionals, getting their own audience via LinkedIn, for instance, or Twitter or whatever channel they choose to use. And so for financial advisors, or I guess just thinking more broadly, people in the professional services world, mm-hmm. can you build a reputable PR brand without social media or do you think in this day and age it's a proof point for journos and clients want to be part of your social media journey? It It is very much, um, it will definitely help you if you do already have your own social media channel and followers via that channel. Mm. Uh, it'll help validate why a journalist will interview you, for instance. It'll help validate with clients in terms of why you're the go-to person for that area of expertise. So, it, again, it depends on the profession because some professions lend themselves better to social media channels than others and obviously in highly regulated mm-hmm. industries mm-hmm. and professions, then then there's very little or you're limited in what you can do via those channels in terms of giving advice or giving insights. So it does really depend then on the sector you're in. But, yeah, definitely there's lots of professionals who have built uh, followings for different reasons, YouTube's another one that, you know, people can get on there and, and build their own audience in their area of expertise. Mm. So it just depends on, on what the professional is trying to do and, and also w- what profession they're in in terms of their audience and how receptive they are to those social media channels. It is something that, you know, strikes me as needing thought 
and rigor. Like if you're going mm. to have a social media um, account, you mm. need a strategy. I say this knowing full well, Liv, that my strategy is somewhat lacking. But um, the idea that actually being quite specific about any goals that you wanted to target from a PR medium mm. landscape and then really critically assessing, well, how often am I going to show up? What am I going to do? How can I be authentic? It does take a lot of work, right? It does. And it, it, you just said there, strategy. And I'd say strategy is one element of it, but consistency is probably the bigger one mm. uh, when it comes to social media and, and having consistency in terms of your delivering of content on that social media platform. Mm. Uh, so in order to really build audience, that's the main thing is, is being consistent. Saying something original, doing something different obviously helps as well. But then the real sticking point is consistency. So people know that if they're going to commit to following you or, or you know, putting adding you on in terms of their social media, that they're going to get something for it. Yeah. And can we talk a little bit more, more about this concept of content marketing? Mm-hmm. What does that actually <laughs> mean? It's it's a pretty broad term, but okay. in in a nutshell, content marketing is marketing around thought leadership and around uh, content for your audience. So I'm giving you information, content, entertainment, whatever it might be. And in exchange, you're learning about my brand or my business or my product. So instead of just the old school above the line marketing advertising, which is we sell X and here is an ad telling you about X, I'm going to tell you about all of these things around a particular service or a particular sector. And in exchange, you're going to learn about my business. And that's a reciprocal kind of agreement then like you get information or entertainment, but at the same time, you're also finding about out about my service or my brand or my product. And is that through sort of weaving that into the yes. set? Yeah. So how does that work? Because you, am I wrong in thinking like people don't want to come across as very salesy? Mm. So how, when you're talking content marketing and you're trying to add value and give people insights and, and information, but you're also trying to share what you do I mean how do the best people do that the best organizations and professionals do it by showing their expertise or by showing their insights so it's giving the audience something on top of this has happened it's giving them what this means for them Mm. and then as a byproduct of that the audience is like wow this organization or this individual really knows what they're talking about or is really on on their game in terms of being ahead of the curve and, and keeping an eye out on what the trends are or what the issues are so that's where that comes into play as in I'm not just telling you about me and how wonderful I am. I'm telling you about these are the things you need to look out for as a company X or an individual Y. And as a byproduct of that, I'm telling you about it. Therefore, I'm your expert. When you see this issue pop up in the future, you're going to remember Mm. me as the organization or me as the professional that's alerted you to it. And do you think expertise is or, or niching when it comes to content marketing is important? It, it can be, particularly if you, you really need to start with your audience, like who are you trying to target? And then that will then dictate how and what you're going to talk about. And I think what I've seen in professional services is sometimes they try and be everything to everyone. Mm. And what's then they just it gets um, it gets complicated because then they're trying to dip their fingers in too many pies. So what's much better is if you just pick one, two, at most three topics and really hone in on them and become known for them as opposed to covering everything under the sun that relates to your industry or your profession. Mm -hmm. And that can be a little bit overwhelming in our world to really distill down sort of what are the three pain points that I want Mm. to be known as an expert in. But I have learnt having done this, there are people who live, there are people who exist and their sole job is actually to help people understand all of this, like what is your audience? What is your message? Mm. How are you going to deliver it? Where are you going to deliver it? Like I think sometimes we live in um, a fast-paced world and we forget that there is an entire other world out there of professionals who do this. Um, I have recently engaged someone to help me with some work that I'm doing and like some of the questions that they ask me are really simple but also extremely thought-provoking and have gotten me to an answer that I'm not sure I would have succinctly been able to get to alone, despite the fact that I've done quite a lot of work on my own personal niche. We just need to ask for the help. In, indeed. And, and sometimes it's you only know what you don't know. Mm. <laughs> um, it, it is very much that. And there are professionals, there's agencies, there's internally in large organisations, there are teams who are focused on this. And it is about 
you know, helping you understand, okay, well, what, what's the outcome you're trying to achieve? Then what's the best channel? What, where is the audience? What is the content? What's the content delivery format? All of those sort mm. of things. So even before you, you get down to what are you going to talk about, there's a oh. whole range of questions you need to answer in terms of where, how, you know, the, the style, et cetera. So it, it, it can be quite overwhelming. And, and that's why there are professionals and teams and agencies, et cetera, that specialize in it. It's fascinating. Actually, when you get stuck into it, it's completely fascinating. I've just had to write avatars, like big, long sort of informations about avatars, content pillars. Like it's, it's interesting and it is quite a big investment in time, I think, but it does set you up. So when those market events occur, mm. you're really clear on exactly how you want to approach it mm. because you've done the pre-work. Yeah. So for those people who are doing social media or they're trialing PR, but they don't have a niche yet or they haven't really distilled down who they're talking to, are they wasting their time? Definitely not. It's, you know, even a little bit helps, I think. And, and you know, you might get one person coming to you down the track who says, oh, I saw that, you know, comment or I saw you in an interview about X or I saw that piece you wrote on the website about Y. And even if you only get one person out of it, that's, that's you know, a good investment then. And obviously the return on investment can vary depending on how much time and effort and money you're putting into it. Mm. But but I think it, it, even if it's um, if you just get one person coming to you and saying, I saw this that you did or I read your whatever it might be or I heard your, you on a podcast and talking about that topic, then I think that's a, a good investment. And it's also good for you as an individual to remember that, you know, you, your brand is, is part of it as well. So it's good practice for you mm. to be constantly thinking about, you know, what's happening in the broader industry or what, what's important to my, to my peers or to my clients or to my um, colleagues, et cetera. And so if people, and obviously just to sort of expand on that, if people are able to niche it down and get a bit more strategic with it, you would imagine that the return on investment would go up. Yeah, definitely. And that's why there's so much um, attention on public relations from a professional services perspective in particular. It's because they rely on it. So word of mouth is mm. so important in that industry and relationships and, and client relationships. And I think as well as we've seen in recent years with social media and, and the um, professional uh, channels for social media, that it's also become almost a um, ticking a box for some organizations in terms of if you've got a uh, LinkedIn account that's got loads of activity, you've got loads of connections that validates you as a professional. And it's the same for boards when it comes to choosing professional service providers, like what what's their media profile? Is the head of their organization in the media being, you know, touted as an expert in the field or do they have senior experts internally who are touted in the media as experts? So like those also help at a board level as much as it is at a personal client level. Mm, so you're actually saying that that people's or the businesses um, media presence or lack thereof can is something that that sort of different areas are looking at. Definitely. And particularly because in this era, unfortunately, we're, um, you know, lit litigation, for example, if if at some point down the track something goes wrong and the boards ask, well, why did you use this professional to give you this advice on this? You can say, well, they've, you know, they were interviewed by this publication on this topic. Mm -hmm. They were, you know, the CEO spoke at this conference about this topic. So again, it's just validating them as a service provider. When people are trialing PR, because we're busy, often, you know, most of us run busy small businesses and there's like a million different hats that we're wearing and mm. and plates are spinning. <laughs> Sometimes they fall and we pick them back up and we move on with our lives. But like what do what do most of us get wrong when we try PR for the first time? Uh, probably just what I said earlier about trying to do too much and, and not being niche enough and not being focused enough because you – if you try and cover too many topic areas or too mm -hmm. many things, it's going to get diluted. And so you don't get known for anything, you know, mm -hmm. the jack of all trades essentially. Mm -hmm. So I'd say that's the first thing. And then secondly is the, um, again, the expectation return on investment is yeah, that consistency is really important. You can't just do one-offs, you know, once every four or six months and expect it to get a great return on investment in terms of interactions or likes mm -hmm. or chatter amongst your peers or, or interest from clients, it, it, it takes a lot to build that momentum and you need to have a, a really good consistent approach to it. Do you have a recommendation on how regularly you should be doing stuff? 
it, again, it kind of comes down to the industry and also your audience because okay. some audiences will expect it and some like client sectors, et cetera, will expect it far more regularly than others. So mm. um, regulatory changes, for instance, in some industries is, is so frequent that they expect their professional service providers to be really on the ball and keeping them update with that thought leadership about those changes on, on a daily, weekly basis, whereas other industries, you know, they might have a regulatory change every four or five years, so they're not really looking for that same intensity. Mm-hmm. So it just depends. And, and again, like some sectors are having a lot of structural changes at the moment, so they would be expecting their service providers to be giving them more updates and information and thought leadership on those changes and what it means for them than perhaps other industries that are not going through those same structural shifts. Mm-hmm. Um, how, just coming back to sort of a, a point you made before around measuring success or measuring return on investment, how do you do that with PR? Well, back in the old days, they used to measure the columns in the newspapers in terms of like the coverage of, of whatever it was, the person or the organisation or the event or whatever it might be. Yeah. Um, it's a little more sophisticated these days. But, <laughs> but yeah, it, it really comes back to, again, eyeballs, um, in terms of, you know, if you've got PR, so in a, in a very basic sense, if you've got coverage in media outlets, mainstream media outlets, the coverage, the number of organisations or the number of publications or the number of outlets that have covered you or have cited you or, you know, if you've put out a report and, you know, X number of publications have covered it or if you've done an interview and X number of publications have, have interviewed you on a topic, um, so yeah, there's different ways of measuring it. Uh, social media is great in terms of getting real time mm. uh, audience feedback. So you know the number of interactions from your audience on those social media channels. If you're doing it via email marketing, then the number of open rates, the number of click through rates. Uh, if you've got a website or a blog or something like that, then obviously it's again it's you've got a lot more uh, real time measurement. But yeah, me- media coverage. The other thing again is like that reputation. So if people have seen it's also who's seen it not just how many people have seen it so if you have if you know a certain um, target audience of yours has seen it in a particular publication or on a particular platform then that's obviously more valuable than having a thousand views but none of them are ever going to be clients or customers Mm. and you're not building that expertise because they don't care about you exactly (laughs) sadly yes Um, okay, let's talk about journalists. I say this to you in the nicest possible way because I know you are a journalist. You have been a journalist. Live journalists can be really scary. <laughs> so I want to talk about working or approaching a journalist and try to understand how do you do that and how do you give them something to work with that helps them? Journalists are extremely time poor and are becoming a very endangered species. Mm. They're predominantly outnumbered by PR professionals um, in Australia. So if you can give them something that makes their life and job easier, that is the biggest benefit, basically. And it doesn't have to be a story today. It could be just heads up about something that's coming down the pipeline in your industry, sector, profession, like there's this change happening or this, you know, these uh, regulatory changes are coming or these structural changes or there's a new entrant or there's a big deal happening that's going to change the face of that sector. Mm -hmm. If you can even just give them a heads up about that and say, look, this is happening, just thought you might want to know. And the best way to do that is, again, like um, depending on the journalist and what what, uh, sort of journalist they are, like whether they're a mainstream, you know, newspaper news journalists or online news journalists or whether they're industry specific journalists or whether they're a radio or whatever they might be just um I always say like think about the audience and then work backwards so if you know your audience listens to this or watches this or reads this participate in that the same as your target audience and then see see the journalists like look up who's covering what and what they're covering and when you know then go to them and say here is whatever it might be about the industry, about the sector, about the um, regulation, et cetera, Um, because that's the best way to go in terms of like find your audience, find what your audience engages with, then see who the journalists are covering it and then approach them. And as I said, it's easier to do that these days because most journalists will have social media channels Mm. and you can approach them directly. Otherwise, you know, there's the old-fashioned like, you know, look them up on 
um, either, you know, their email address or whatever it might be. So that that would be my my main piece of advice is just, yeah, see how you can make their life easier. It doesn't have to be a story today, but it could be just a heads up and then down the track when they're covering that particular issue change, whatever it might be, regulation, they'll remember you and be like, hey, I need a comment about this. Can you help me out? Or I need, I need to speak to someone who works in an organisation of this type. Do you, are you able to help me there? Yeah, and they do have quite tight time frames sometimes on their stories, don't they? Yeah, I mean, in the online world, it's it's literally minutes count in terms of getting stories online. So the faster you are at responding to them or if you can even be preemptive is the best. Like if you can say, this is happening tomorrow, therefore I'm going to contact you today so that you've got the heads up about it and also I'm going to give you a quote that, you know, email you a quote as soon as it's happened so that you've got something to work with straight away. Those are those are the best in terms of being a journalist. Those are the best contacts to have and, and the best sources to have. People give quotes the day before? Sometimes, yeah. Oh, it never even occurred to me that, that that would be a thing. Particularly well, if it's to do with um, regulatory changes or like a big court case or a big government announcement where they know it's it's going to be one of two things, for instance. They'll mm. give you a quote for, you know, in, in the event it's A and in the event it's B, here are our two quotes ready to go. And that would be really relevant in our world, for example, when interest rates go up. or the, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. The senior economists will have pre-prepared comments depending on what the RBA does. So I, the RBA's put it up there or they've kept it steady. They would have quotes ready to go the day mm. before depending on which way it goes so that they can press send as soon as it happens. And so developing the relationship with the journalists ahead of time is obviously quite important. Mm. I guess hearing what you're saying around them being time poor, and, yes, the ones that I know, I don't know if they're a dying breed. You would know more about that than me, but they are working. Many of them that I know are freelance now and they work on many different publications, which gives you lots of different opportunity, but you realise how very busy and and spread thin Mm. they are. But actually approaching them, I didn't find as difficult as I thought it was going to be. Is LinkedIn, Twitter, like do you think that they respond to sort of all social media channels yeah 100 percent. all social media channels and as i said most journalists these days are on multiple and if you can yeah if you can give them something or heads up or even just a you know you're doing a great job covering topic why that's that's really helpful for them and, and really beneficial and is it just a good way of opening dialogue mm-hmm. and one of the things we also talked about was having ideas for journalists that have a bit of a different take on a a typical story can you elaborate on what that might mean for advisors who are wanting to contribute but don't want to add just more noise of the same stuff that's already been said before yeah because often we're all talking about the same big things that are happening in our in our world whether it's you know interest rates or petrol price or cost of living in general Mm. um what i recommend is for particularly for people who are selling a service if you want to try and get your name out there it's it is hard and amongst all that clutter and um Mm. It's good to pick a subset or p- pick a new angle on an existing issue. So find a particular segment of society or a segment of the business community or a particular customer segment that you can then work out what the implications are for them from this mainstream issue challenge change and then pitch that in terms of did you know that this will have a domino effect on this particular segment of the market or this particular demographic or this particular client? Mm -hmm. That's a good way to differentiate yourself because, again, journalists will normally go to the (laughs) um, easiest option in terms of those big challenges and big issues and, you know, RBA interest rates. They'll go to the main banks who all have senior economists, for example. Mm. But then smaller banks or or, uh, professional services who want to still be involved in that dialogue around that issue for them to get their voice heard. They just need to pick a new angle to get in basically. So just find a a new um, implication from it to then talk to media about. Now, Liv, you've actually worked with professional services, businesses overseas to take people from being an expert, not only at their desk, but an expert in the media Mm. realm as well. And I'd imagine you would have got different responses from people. Like, were there partners that you worked with that were gung-ho and really excited to do it and others who worked in the same firm that were absolutely not doing it that needed to sort of be, I won't say dragged, but um, (laughs) provided more insight on the opportunity? And, like, how do you navigate that when, when you're, let's say that you're in a partnership and you've got 
you know, you think you've got great opportunities and you want all partners to be involved, but some aren't as keen. Did you have that problem? How did you navigate that? 100% working in our law firms, you have partners who they want media coverage as much as they can get and unfortunately don't necessarily have the best practice that translates to media coverage. And then you've got others who have practices that would be really good for media coverage and just have no interest whatsoever. Mm. Um, so it is, it definitely is a, an art of getting those ones on board and also getting the other ones to have a bit more of a, I guess, realistic expectation when it comes to coverage, um, depending on, on their practice area, their seniority, their, their client base. But that is the good thing about thought leadership in that it does, I guess, give different opportunities at, to professionals of different levels, different experiences, different practice areas. Um, the ones who, you know, have the, you know, really interesting, juicy practices and big clients and um, are more hesitant, it's about convincing them about the benefit of the PR and, and that thought leadership, not just for them, but perhaps for the broader firm and for the broader practice, et cetera. And, I think in um, law firm terms, you can just say about building your practice and making it, you know, even more successful. And for the others, again, it's about finding those niches into a topic area that they can help them to build their practice so that they they become more successful. And but just making sure that they realize that yeah, Rome was a build in a day, so <laughs> they need to have realistic expectations. And they might think it's the most important thing in the world, but media are covering, you know, so many different. Uh, facets of the economy so they just need to be a bit realistic there I think that's very transferable to financial services like I know that you did this in law firms but I think the niching and the specialization dare we say the hesitation and perhaps some ego they all exist in our world (laughs) every profession (laughs) (laughs) and so I think all of those things remain acutely relevant here Um, are there any other tips or tricks you would give to people who are trialing this for the first time maybe managing expectations like help them understand how long something might take or how how much work or effort it might be the just being original is probably the main one and and yeah it can take a lot of effort and it can seem like you're you're putting in a lot of time and effort into something that doesn't really have any return on investment but at the end of the day, every little bit helps. And, and it's also just really good practice then so that when in the event that something does go wrong down the line, mm. you've got those media contacts. So you understand that media um, ecosystem. So you're better prepared to deal with it. So I would say that yeah, no matter if it seems like something really trivial, that every little bit helps. Um, but again, it is just about putting in that that effort and realizing that it, it could take a long time. Like I worked with a partner who he um, early on saw the implications of Bitcoin on GST mm. law in Australia. And so he got really um, interested in that and started writing about that and following ATO cases involving that. And then, you know, when it when a big case then blew up with the ATO, he was there ready to go as a known expert on this topic. So, it yeah, it, it can take a while, but if you get it right and if the timing's right, then the rewards can be very large. Thank you. Lots to ponder. And it's what I'm hearing from today's conversation. And and I also knew it, but I'm reminded of it is this is not a fluffy, superfluous thing. This is tactical and strategic and it's work and it should be part of everyone's sort of business strategy. Mm-hmm. It's, it's more than just posting a newsletter once every quarter and hoping for the best. You can mm-hmm. gain much more in terms of business revenue, but also I would imagine client stickiness um, and opportunity for other people within your business as well. So um, I think good reminder for all of us to be very considered in what we're doing on the PR media front. Yeah, definitely. It's it's both for getting new clients or customers, it's keeping your current clients, (laughs) making sure that they see your face and name or or brand uh, in the marketplace so that they remain confident in their decision to engage you. And then also, yeah, as a recruitment tool, for instance, it's also quite valuable. Mm -hmm. Um, This has been fantastic. Before we finish up today, Liv, can I ask you a couple of rapid fire questions? Of course. (gasps) Okay. I would like to know one thing that you do to look after your mental health. I love to run. So running is my mental health tool. I, l- I love to just go for a run and that's that's how I stay sane. Mm-hmm. Do you run in the rain? Uh, yes, I do run in the rain. It depends on the temperature outside. Okay, good on you. Uh, do you have a piece of advice that you would give your younger self? 
Yeah, um, this is an interesting one. I I think it's okay to expect more and to want more. I think as um, in Australia, like uh, having over ambition or having a lot of ambition can sometimes be frowned upon in workplaces. Mm. Whereas what I would tell my younger, younger self, my baby journalist self is that it's okay to do that and to, and to want that. Good on you. I don't think that's a piece of advice that's given enough. Hmm. Well, tall poppy syndrome in Australia. So that doesn't surprise me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I need to get rid of that. Um, do you have something on your bucket list that you're yet to tick off yet? I do. I would love to sit in a global role um overseas so that would probably be my one thing um I was in a global role in Singapore but I would love to yeah in a more senior global role that would probably be my bucket list uh last for you is do you have a book recommendation for me to read as part of my fake book club (laughs) um I do actually I have the pleasure of knowing a fellow uh journalist uh by the name of Georgie Dent um and she wrote a book uh called Breaking Badly How I Worried Myself Sick and it's a story about how as a young woman and a law student um she was quite unwell like um mental health issues and it actually took going to a um facility uh and and taking time out from her crazy life to get better and so i think that that's a it's a very honest book about a very real issue in society these days well not only in society we know that in financial services this is at really epidemic proportions and so that sounds like something that we need to put on our list i haven't heard of that one so thank you i shall be adding that on yeah georgie's a great uh i think role model for a better awareness about mental health issues in Australia. So highly recommend. And she speaks very um, openly and candidly about her struggles previously with um, mental health. Amazing. Uh, Liv, thank you so much for being today's guest. The XY community is very grateful for your insights. (laughs) My pleasure. 